Welcome, friends, to our New Psalmist YouTube channel. We are excited about the content we are uploading week after week that's going to be a real blessing. Make sure you subscribe to our channel and hit the little bell so you get notifications. Well, good evening and welcome to our Thursday night Bible study here at New Psalmist. I'm Dr. Walter Thomas, Jr., pastor-elect of New Psalmist Baptist Church, and I know tonight looks a little bit different. Um, here in Baltimore, we've been having some storms come through and some of our systems have got a little uh, shaky. So we're making sure everything is ready to go for Sunday. So tonight our Bible study format looks a little different, um, but we still want to dive into the word on tonight. So if you could do me a favor, even before we kick off in prayer and everything else, hit that share button, send the text message, invite somebody else, tell them we're in Bible class right now. And we'd love for them to join us, even as you're coming in to the chat room and the virtual sanctuary, the virtual classroom tonight. Make sure you drop a word of greeting, a hello, a wave hand emoji, tag somebody's name who you see is there. Maybe it's one of your church family members. Let them know you're glad to see them tonight. And let, let's connect together, even in this virtual space. If you haven't done so, hit that subscribe button and that notification button right on our YouTube channel. So you always know when we're posting new content or going live, so you can stay connected with the virtual side of New Psalmist. And I'm glad to have you here tonight. And in this season, we've just gotten past Holy Week. And so I'm looking forward to diving in a little bit into this past Sunday's message from the resurrection story and the narrative that goes forth after the resurrection of Jesus Christ. But I want to ask you again, hit that share button, invite somebody, tell them to join you. And I want to let you know in a few moments, some things coming up here at New Psalmist starting this Sunday. But first, let's go to God in prayer. Father, now God, first of all, we come tonight with thanksgiving on our lips and our hearts. We are thankful and grateful for who you are, what you do, and thankful, God, that we can call you our Heavenly Father. Tonight, God, it is our prayer. You might speak, you might move, you might open our ears, hearts, minds, and spirits to receive. Let us be receptors tonight to your word, your will, and your path for our lives. It's in Jesus' name. Together we all say amen. If you haven't done so, hit that share button, send your comment, let us know that you're in the room, where you're joining us from, so we can connect tonight. But coming up this Sunday, I told you, it's something coming up starting this Sunday. This Sunday, y'all, we get to celebrate the greatest pastor and first lady in the world. Our pastor, Bishop Walter Scott Thomas Sr., our first lady, Deaconess Patricia Thomas, as they have served 49 years here at New Psalmist Baptist Church, y'all. That is a monumental accomplishment and is one that we do not want to let just pass us by. We want to celebrate these years that they've served and celebrate how they've been a blessing and ministered to our souls. So this Sunday is our pastoral anniversary. Reverend Matthew Watley from Kingdom Fellowship AME Church will be preaching. We'll be saluting our pastor and first lady and asking every member to bring a gift of thanks for our pastor and our first lady. We want to let them know that we love them, we appreciate them, we care mm -hmm. for them, and we are grateful to God that he blessed us to be blessed by their ministry. So that's this Sunday. Nine o'clock. If you're in person, if you're virtual, make sure you have that gift that you want to give to be a blessing to our pastor and our first lady this coming Sunday. I'm excited, y'all. 49 years of ministry leadership, faithful, committed at one location. That is something we do not see happen every day. And we want to celebrate it and let them know how much we love them and how much we care for them. That's this Sunday at nine o'clock. And Pastor Watley is going to preach a mighty word. So you want to make sure that your face is in the place. Then the following Sunday, we kick off our installation season at four o'clock on Sunday, April 14th. We'll be having our pre-installation service. Pastor John Jenkins and First Baptist Church of Glen Arden are going to be sharing with us. We'll be sharing in communion as well. We're looking forward to kicking off this season as pastor and people come together. I'll be formally installed on May the 4th. That's a Saturday morning at 10 o'clock. But we're kicking off this installation season, getting excited and ready for what God has in store on April the 14th 
at 4 p.m. right at New Summer. So we want to make sure you're there for those events, those upcoming things. We've got other things that are going on. Stay connected with us on social media, on our website, our e-blast, or call the church and ask, hey, what's happening at New Summers this week? And they'll let you know what's going on. But I want to get into our time of study this evening. And also, before I do that, let me thank you as well for those who are giving tonight. There are ways to give with GiveLify, PushPay, Fellowship One, or adding it to your Sunday morning envelope when you drop it on, even or even mailing in your offering. But I want to thank you for those who give to support even during our Bible study time. L listen, church, one of the things that allows us to bring this in this manner and produce this, whether it's in the building or at another location to have the tools and resources, is your generosity and your stewardship. So we've got to say thank you for that. And even now, if you're giving, thank you as well. You're giving later. Thank you. We're grateful and appreciative of it. Sunday, I kicked off a new series, a new series called Standing on Business. Standing on business. Do me a favor and just type that right there in the chat room. Standing on business. Because over these next few weeks, um, coming out of Pastor's anniversary, going all the way down to Pentecost, we're going to be standing on business. Standing on business is a modern way of pretty much saying, taking care of your business. And we're going to find out what exactly our business is as the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. Why it's so important that we stand on business, that we don't back down, that we take it serious, seriously, especially in this day and age where we see the numbers rising of people who are walking away from church, of young people who are deciding that's not the direction for their adult future. As a matter of fact, a group that Bishop Thomas and I have been working with has statistics that every year, and I need you to get this, every year, one million young people walk away from church. Let me say it again for those who may have logged on late. Every year, one million young people walk away from church. Those who are reared and raised in Sunday school and youth and children's ministry, every year, one million of them say, I don't need this anymore. It's time for us to stand on business, to take care of our business, to stand our ground and be definitive, declarative and confident in that which we preach, that which we believe and that which we share with others. It's important that we do that in this season. And so I'm excited about this series and kicked it off Sunday with the message. Fake news was one of the titles. The other title and the one that stuck close with me was I love a good lie. It came from the resurrection narrative found in the gospel of Matthew chapter 28. So if you have your Bible, I want you to open up to that. Matthew chapter 28 verses 1 through 15 were the larger portion. But I want to read to you kind of the key part um, from the New King James Version, starting at verse 11. It says, now, now while they were going, talking about the women who are leaving the tomb, while they were going, behold, some of the guard came into the city and reported to the chief priests all the things that had happened. When they had assembled with the elders and consulted them, they gave a large sum of money to the soldiers saying, tell them the disciples came at night, stole him away while we slept. And if this comes to the governor's ears, we'll appease him and make you secure. So pretty much this is the other side of the resurrection story, the other side of the Easter story where you have those who are celebrating and rejoicing, somewhat confused, but still happy that Jesus is alive. You then have this other side, this other narrative that is posed by the soldiers and the leaders, those who were behind setting up Jesus and really pushing to see him crucified. The story that they then share about what happens on that resurrection Sunday. And it led me to this idea of a good lie, which I'm not going, I'm, I'm going to tell you all the truth. When I first was dropped up on my spirit, I kind of said to myself, oh my God, a good lie. Somebody could take that out of context and think that the pastor is suggesting to them uh, that they should go out here and, and, and be um, untruthful and, and sharing some falsehoods on purpose. That's not what I'm suggesting or what I'm saying. Well, what I'm saying is 
that there can be some good that is exposed by a lie. And so the things I shared Sunday, just the cliff notes were that a good lie exposes liars. A good lie is evidence of an imminent threat, meaning that the one who's being lied on or the situation that's being lied on is only being lied on because it is not just a threat, but an imminent threat. That means it's oncoming. That means it is charging forth. That means it is not far off and it has potential and power to cause some damage. So a good lie is evidence of an imminent threat. But then also a good lie emerges when the truth itself is empowering. When the truth has the power and the capability to really bring about change and transformation, a good lie will emerge. But that lie becomes good because it notifies us that there is a truth that has the power to change and transform. And so thinking about this whole idea, I want to dive a little deeper into some of the things that I saw in this text that I couldn't share on Sunday, which is why I love this chance when we come together to what Bishop affectionately calls the cutting room floor, the pieces of research and study that were not able to be um, shared and digested in the preaching moment because of that limited time. And so now we get at least an additional 30 minutes or so to do that in our Bible study time together. And so when the text talks about this false narrative that comes up from the resurrection, the question can be asked, why is there the need for one? Why is there the need for another story? And that is to undercut the power of the resurrection. Those of us who sit on the other side of the cross and those of us who are believers, we know that there's power in not just the cross. There's power in the resurrection. There's power because it lets us know that God cannot be defeated. It's power because it lets us know that our God has the final say. It's power because it lets us know that our God is able to turn any situation around. There's power in the resurrection. And so this false narrative is presented to undercut that power to understand fully why and to understand what led to the preaching of this message, I want you to fully understand the greater context of what is happening surrounding this resurrection story. I know for some of us, this may be, oh, I know all of this already, but just stick with me for a little bit because I want to highlight some things that lead to where we were Sunday morning. Many of us know the reason why Jesus is crucified is because of his ministry his teaching, and his changing of lives. The ministry of Jesus was going forth in such a way that those who were in power and position and had prestige saw that fading away. They saw Jesus coming as an imminent threat to their power, position, and prestige. They saw him coming as a threat to the way they lived and enjoyed life now. Yes, it is posed as he is a threat or he is going against the laws of Moses, but he's healing the sick. He's opening blinded eyes, unstopping deaf ears, even raises a man from the dead. There's miracle working power flowing through him. And instead of embracing it, they see how it goes against the status quo. And even in that, there is a lesson for us in life that is not always about following the A's, B's, and C's of it all. But the greater question is this, is the job getting done? Is the mission being accomplished? Is the objective being met? If so, maybe we should look at this a little bit differently and ask ourselves, is something new happening here that falls in line with what it is we espouse and what we believe? I'll give you an example. I had to learn this leadership lesson some years ago when I began pastoring and started thinking about those who I had been called to lead and serve. I am a person, and I don't think I'm the only personality type like this, who knows the way they like something done. And so to a fault, 
I will sometimes do it instead of empowering others or delegating others to do it because I have the way that I like it done. Sometimes as a leader, you've got to realize they may not, others may not do it the way you like it, but they will get the job done. They may not follow your preference and your steps and do it the way exactly you would have made it happen, but they'll get it done. That's a part of the role of leadership. Not always that they do it your way, but that they learn how to make it happen without burning bridges and, and cutting off everyone. They learn how to make it happen and make it happen effectively, even though it may not be the way you and I would have done it. For the religious leaders in the day of Jesus, the problem is he's doing things in a way that they don't like, a way that threatens them. That is why they go after Jesus. In Matthew's gospel, he highlights it going back to chapter 21 of his gospel. If you got that Bible, just flip over a few pages. Maybe you got your app. Just go ahead, tap the buttons. Go ahead back to Matthew chapter 21. Because in Matthew chapter 21, that is where we find the beginning of the Passion Week narrative, the, the triumphant entry when Jesus rides into the city. In Matthew 21, says, as they approached Jerusalem, came to Bethphage, the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, go to the village ahead of you at once, find the donkey there, had caught with her, untie them, bring them to me. If anyone says, if anyone says anything to you, say the Lord needs them and he will send them right away. Now, as you go down a little bit, go down to verse number eight of chapter 21 of Matthew, a very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road while others cut branches from trees and spread them on the road. The crowds that went ahead of him and those that followed shouted, Hosanna, son of David, blessed is the one, he who comes in the name of the Lord, Hosanna in the highest. And Jesus entered Jerusalem. The whole city was stirred and asked, who is this? So the word starts getting out about Jesus on that Palm Sunday, the triumphant entry. But then Matthew goes into another part from there. He goes from the triumphant entry and then down at verse number 12 into Jesus entering the temple. And when Jesus enters the temple, he goes off. In Matthew's gospel, he goes from the triumphant entry of Jesus riding into the city on what we call Palm Sunday to him going into the temple. And in the temple, he finds that there are people there who are cheating the people of God. That's why he says in, in verse number 13, rather, I'll go back to verse 12. He entered the temple, this is chapter 21 of Matthew. He entered the temple courts, drove out all who were buying and selling. He overturned the tables of money changers and the benches of those selling doves. That part is key. Those selling doves. It is written, he said, my house will be called a house of prayer, but you are making it a den of robbers. And in, in more contemporary times, there have been some who have tried to use that scripture as the reason to why churches should not uh, have cafes in their lobbies or bookstores or different things of that nature where they're selling things. That is a misinterpretation and misunderstanding of the reason why Jesus overturned the temple, the tables of the temple. The reason why Jesus did that, he said, you have made my father's house, which is supposed to be a house of prayer. Here's the key part into a den of robbers. He talks about those turning over rather the tables with those who were selling doves. That is because they had hiked up the prices of the doves that persons would come and buy to be a part of their worship experience, a part of their giving to God. These doves, they hiked up the prices and were taking that difference and pocketing it for themselves. They were robbing the people. That practice was happening throughout the temple. That persons were adding on a buffer to line their own pockets and take from the people of God. And so when Jesus comes in and sees this going on, he starts turning over the tables because they've taken a place for prayer and have been robbing the people, not because they selling stuff. That's not the issue here. The issue is they are robbing the people who have brought money 
that has been designated to give to the house of God, designated to give to the work of the people of God, designated to give to the sacrifices that they're giving to God. So that's the issue here. But when Jesus comes in and starts flipping these tables, now the folk who are profiting off the people take issue with him. The folk whose pockets were being lined, they now have an issue with Jesus because he's taking money out of their pocket and telling the people this ain't right. These folk are taking advantage of you. These people are doing you wrong. This too includes the religious leaders who had co-signed on this because they too were benefiting by grifting the people in their own right. This becomes an issue. Again, Jesus is going after power, prestige, and position. People are now losing the things that they set in place that are not a part of the law of God and the law of Moses. No, it's things that they have added on to benefit and to profit themselves. So Jesus goes after them because they're taking advantage of the people. They are robbing God, keeping profits for themselves. He challenges the norm and the status quo. Even though it was wrong what they were doing, it had become the norm. And so it was now accepted. Jesus challenges it. And sometimes we have to challenge the norms when we know the norms are not right. When we know the norms are unjust, when we know the norms are unfair, we still have to challenge the norm. Even though it's become normal, it's not right. Even though it's a status quo, it's not right. That is what a part of standing on business means. It means I'm not just going along with standard. I'm not just going along with the status quo. I'm not just going along to get along. I'm standing on what I believe. I'm standing on my principles, the promises of God. I'm standing on my faith. I'm standing on my belief. I'm standing on business. I know it's Thursday night, but I got at least five or 10 folk in this classroom who can say, I'm standing on business. And when you say it, you got to hold your head up, put your chest out a little bit, say, I'm standing on business. Jesus is, is under the radar or either in the radar now, in the crosshairs, because he's standing on business, goes in there and turns over the tables. And so from here up until we see the crucifixion in the Last Supper narrative, they are trying to trip Jesus up. They ask him about what authority he operates under in verse 23 of this chapter and start trying to discredit him. And when we get to chapter 21, they start trying to trap him over questions about money and who it is that should get the money and the taxes and what have you. And the different groups start setting up, trying to set him up, rather. The Pharisees try and set him up. The Sadducees try and set him up and asking him questions about the resurrection because they do not believe that resurrection is possible. All of this is the context that leads up to Matthew 26. So turn me in your Bible, chapter 26, chapter 26 of the Gospel of Matthew, because here becomes the crux of what leads to what happens in the crucifixion and what happens when we're talking about this text for the purposes of this series launch, standing on business and the message, I love a good lie. Matthew 26 is where we see everything kind of break off. And I'm reading from the NIV, Matthew 26, verses three through five. This is what it says. Then the chief priests and the elders of the people ascended, ascended, assembled in the palace of the high priest whose name was Caiaphas. And they schemed to arrest Jesus secretly and kill him. But not during the festival, they said, or there may be a riot among the people. So the plot's now been hatched, right? they Jesus, time after time, has taken what they try to throw at him and thrown it back at them. He's had an answer for everything. He is the word made flesh. He is word incarnate. And so he speaks a word every time they come after him. That's why sometimes it's good to have some word built up in you because you never know when you let that word out. But every time they come at Jesus, he has a response, a godly response, a Christian response. I know Jesus himself is not a Christian, but he's Christ-like because he is the Christ. That's why I call it a Christian response. 
He responds to them in an appropriate, proper way, every time dismantling their argument and breaking down the traps they have set up for him. And so they just say, you know what? We've had enough. We have to plot to do this secretly, arrest him secretly, and kill him. Chapter 26, we see that plot play out. And so we know the story, how they go through it and all. Judas betrays him. But we know all of that. We just went through the whole weekend. I know it well. I preached three times in the past four days of the last week. So I get it. We, we get all that. When we get to after the crucifixion, this is when the setup, the good lie starts up. When we see Jesus is, is crucified on Good Friday, taken off the cross and his body is put into a borrowed tomb. In chapter 27, round verse number 62, we begin to see the setup start. So chapter 27, I, I know you, we're flipping through our Bibles tonight, but we, we that's what Bible study is about, going through the book. Chapter 27, Judas has already hung himself because he can't deal with what has happened and he feels so guilty. Chapter 27, verse number 62, though, this is where we find the beginning of the setup. Chapter 27, verse 62 from the NIV. The next day, the one after preparation day, the chief priests and the Pharisees went to Pilate. Sir, they said, remember while he was alive, the deceiver said, three days I will rise again. Give the orders to the tomb to make sure it's secure until the third day. Otherwise, the disciples may come and steal the body. So originally, when Jesus dies, that's supposed to be it. They'll put him in the tomb because that's where dead bodies go. End of story. Joseph of Arimathea has come to claim the body. He's going to put him in his tomb. That'll be it. But the religious leaders go. Says the chief priests and the Pharisees go to Pilate. And they say, we heard about his teachings. Truthfully, some of them may have been there when he taught it because they wanted to hear Jesus preach. Your enemies will show up when God is moving through you, even just to see how. They may not be on your side, but they still want to see how God's going to move. That's another lesson, another sermon for a whole nother day. But they, they know what he's told. They know what he said. Destroy this temple. Three days, I'll raise it up. And so to combat that, they say, hey, uh, Pilate, you know what? This is what this man was saying. This is what he was teaching. So a stone isn't enough. We know that tombs are closed with stones, but a stone isn't enough. We know that no human individual can roll that stone away, but a stone isn't enough. We need a stone, we need a seal, and we need soldiers. Originally, it would have just been the stone, which would have been adequate to keep anybody out of the grave. As a matter of fact, that there are some who argue that, or rather present, one of the models of the way in which tombs were closed, and they, they offer this for the tomb of Jesus, is that a boulder was placed atop a hill and was rolled down into a groove, if you will, to seal a tomb shut, that the stone itself could not be rolled away because it had to be rolled back uphill. And so it's a stone of a massive nature. It's not something you can just roll on and roll off. The stone itself is supposed to seal the tomb to not just keep a body in, but to keep the scent in, to, to keep everything else inside of the tomb. That's why when the women are coming to the tomb in the gospel, they say, who going to roll the stone away? Who, who's going to do this? Because that's, that's going to take an effort, and we we can't do it. It's, it's, not, it's not the norm. Stone's not supposed to be rolled away. That doesn't, that doesn't just happen like that. It takes work and effort. Why, when Jesus raises Lazarus from the dead, the dead, they have to give the instruction to roll the stone away because it's going to take a team, a crew of all those mourners to roll the stone away from the tomb of Lazarus. And so the stone would have been enough. They say we need a stone, a seal, and shoulders because the enemy likes to go for overkill. The enemy likes to overplay their hand. Because they know, get this, their hand is weak. Mm, I, I do hope somebody caught that for yourself. I just caught it for me too. And I feel like shouting around this house a little bit. The enemy overplays his hand when he knows his hand is weak. 
He talks like he has a handful of trumps. And I'm sorry for those who don't play spades, but that means you've got a real good hand with all the winning cards. He talks like he has a handful of winning cards. But when it comes to our adversary and our opposition, they have a big bark, but no bite. So they overplay their hand. We want stone. We want it sealed. And we want soldiers as well, because it would have only been a stone in front of the tomb, which would have been sufficient to keep folk out. I don't want to jump around too much, but let me just drop this in real quick. And, and, and at some point in a later time, I'll really expound on this. But the issue of the resurrection and Easter Sunday wasn't about anybody getting out. The real issue was about us getting in. You see, if I had a little more time, I would break that all down. But I know y'all y'all got food on the stove. You want to get to bed early. So I ain't going to stay there too long. But I just want to drop that in for somebody. Somebody will catch it at least in the next 30 days. So 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 there's a setup of starting. Setup of starting, chapter 27. Sown, soldiers, I'm sealed. All that stuff placed upon the tomb. That's before Resurrection Sunday. Afterwards, we get to our point, chapter 28, when Jesus is alive, he's risen from the dead. And the guards come and tell their story. And the lie begins. Now, here are the problems and the fallacies of this lie that should help us as we journey through life and have these moments where untruths, falsehoods are spread, where conspiracies, and I, I don't mean that in like some conspiracy theory sense, but I simply mean where opposition works to try and deter and deny you from destiny and purpose. We just drop this in the chat real quick. The devil is a liar because it's never going to work. But here's some of the, the issues that I want to lift up from the text. The first issue I want to lift up is that is based on the report from the guards. Right. And in chapter 20, 28, when, when I read this to you Sunday, says the women are on their way. Some of the guards went into the city and reported to the chief priests everything that had happened here's the problem and i didn't get to really expound on this sunday the guards don't know everything that happened uh, they, they don't know the whole story their report that they give is incomplete it's flawed it's missing pieces they do not know the whole story Okay, somebody may be like, well, how in the world you get that, Pastor? I'm glad you asked. When, when we look at the first part of chapter 28, this is what it says. I'm going to read it verbatim, NIV. After the Sabbath at dawn, on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to look at the tomb. There was a violent earthquake, for an angel of the Lord came down from heaven and going to the tomb, rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning. His clothes were white as snow. The guards were so afraid of him that they shook and became like dead men. So earthquake, they see that. A, a figure dressed in white descending, they see that. And they see that figure roll the stone away. But this is what it says. This is what it says. The guards were so afraid of him. So we know they at least see him. Maybe they didn't see the stone. We don't know. But they see him. They're so afraid of him. They shook and became like dead men. I would even suggest to you, they don't see the stone rolled away. Once they see the angel, they become like dead men. And the Greek, the word that is used here, it talks about them being like dead men. It is the word also used for a corpse. It's really saying that they fainted. They passed out. The soldiers passed out when they saw the angel. They felt the earthquake. They saw the angel and they were so afraid they passed out. They may not have seen the stone rolled away. That maybe they did. Maybe they didn't. We don't know that part for sure. But what we do know, they do not hear what the angel says to Mary and Mary. They do not hear the message. They don't have the whole story. When they wake up, there's an empty tomb. So their report is not full. And they can't, they try to then establish a lie 
off of a incomplete report. Here's what I want us to get. No one knows your whole story except you and God. And so they cannot create an effective counter narrative because they do not know all the ins and outs of your story. And so the reason why a good lie exposes the liars is because the liars are working off of faulty information. They do not know everything about your story, all that you've gone through, all that you overcome, all that you had to face. They do not know everything. All they know is that, get this, what that which God has allowed them to see. <laughs> good God Almighty. All they know is that which God has allowed them to view. But they do not know your whole story. The guards faint. They, they are like corpses. They do not hear what the angel said. They may not have seen the stone rolled away. When they go to the chief priest, they say, we were at the tomb. There was an earthquake. A white figure descended. And when we woke up, there was an empty tomb. And maybe they added some other stuff because they didn't want to make it seem as though they had passed out and they were afraid and scared. But that is how the lie starts. But it is not based on the facts. Ah, good God Almighty. And and so and so and so this 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 formulation of this lie is based off of faulty information. Because if if the truth gets out, here's the problem with the truth. It reveals the guards couldn't do anything. It reveals the steel could the seal could not stop what God was doing. Couldn't it reveals the stone could not stop it. It reveals that the agenda of your opposition is defeated. That's why the lie emerges, because the truth is too damaging to their agenda and their narrative and their objectives and their plan and it would have worked and i shared this sunday it would have worked except there was another report you had the report of the guards but then you also had the report of the woman at the tomb who had the whole story who felt the earthquake who saw the angel who saw the stone being rolled away and who heard that jesus is alive Folk on your side, you, you have the whole in, the whole story. You know all the information. Your opposition does not. Doesn't even matter how close to you they were. The soldiers were right there. But they do not have the whole story. And that which is contrarian to you and the plan of God for your life does not know your whole story. Does not know everything that you have come through. Every tear you have cried, every sacrifice you have made, it does not know your whole story. And, and so these women, I'm grateful for them. And, and I'm grateful that God uses them on this Resurrection Sunday because they help us understand the necessity of standing on business, taking care of your business. That business is sharing the message. Jesus is alive and they take it to the disciples they take it to the followers of jesus christ and they share it with them that it continues to be shared until this day what has god given you to share what what, what has god given you to spread and to speak to others what has god put in you and whispered into your ear into your spirit that is not simply meant for your own consumption, but that you might take it, spread it, and share it to others. Whatever it is that God has given in you, and may, maybe it's a word, maybe it is a using of a gift and ability, maybe it is a talent God has given you that is meant to be shared and spread. Standing on business means taking it and using it, putting it to work. Not sitting on your gift, not sitting on your skill, not sitting on what it is that you are able and capable to do, not sitting on that word or that message revelation God has given you. It is taking it and running with it. Those sisters ran with the message. We must run with what it is God has deposited into us. Because if we don't do it, who will? 
if God's given you something to carry, something that he has placed inside of you, if you don't run with it, who will? Who will take it? Who will move forward? Who will take it to the next destination? If not you, then who? God's given it to you for a reason, trusted you with it for a reason. He knows who you are. He made you. He created you. He formed you. He's given it to you. Now we must stand on business, put it to work, take care of our business and combat the lie, the false narrative, the, the cultural norm that does not line up with the purposes, plan, and power of God. We must stand on business. The women show us that necessity in taking that message and running with it to make sure that the lie does not live, but rather that the truth reigns. And the truth is so damaging to the opposition because the truth will cause kingdoms to crumble. Let me say it again. Truth will cause kingdoms to crumble. I say kingdoms in air quotes because I mean the kingdoms of this world. The kingdoms that are set up by those who have man-made position, authority, and power. The opposition that is pushing a counter narrative. Because if the real report comes out, their kingdoms will crumble. But here's the truth. Any man-made kingdom will fall. Just write down this notation for me, Revelation 11, Revelation, last book of the Bible, chapter 11. In that chapter, it says this, the kingdoms of this world will become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. Man-made kingdoms will crumble and they will fall when the truth comes to light. Now, let me share this last thing and then we'll wrap up for tonight. Well, I think we, we, we've done good time here in this place, in this space. And again, I don't want you to burn, burn any bread or toast. Um, sometimes the, the lie that is being told, it's not just about you. Sometimes it's to you. Sometimes we are told things about ourselves that are not true. We are told about what we are not, what we can't do, what we can't be, where we cannot go. And it's just not true. There are actually people and forces in this life who do their best to try and keep others from reaching their full potential, from reaching their purpose, from becoming who it is that they've been called and destined to be. If I were to use a fairy tale as an example, there are those stepsisters who tell Cinderella to stay home and clean. There are folk who want to keep people in lesser places than what they have been destined for. So sometimes the lie is not just about you, it's to you. There are some who have, has, as children, were told by parents or adults about what they would never become. I've heard often of sports athletes who were told by coaches what they'll never do. And then they made up their mind they were going to prove them wrong. I want to suggest to somebody who was told what you could not be, what you would never do, stand on business by proving that devil wrong. Stand, stand on business by proving that oppositional force wrong. Because the lie isn't always about you. Sometimes the lie is to you, about you. Not just about something being spread about what you did or didn't do. It's not just a story being put out there about you that goes against your character and about things you've actually done. But sometimes the lie is to get you to think less of yourself and to get you to discredit yourself. The reason for that and the reason why you can, it's a good lie, as I say, is because it lets you know the opposition is scared of you. By that, I mean they are afraid of you becoming, afraid of you fulfilling your purpose, afraid of you reaching your full potential. They are scared of the you you were called and created to be. 
Because if you really knew the truth about yourself, they are chains that would fall off immediately. They are yokes that will be destroyed immediately. If you really knew and understood who you are, I want to help you tonight understand you are God's child. God loves you unconditionally. God looks at you as the apple of his eye. He stands with arms wide open to receive you as his own because you are his. Do not let any devil, any force, any person tell you anything less about yourself. You are loved by God unconditionally. Do not let any other lie live. And stand on business confidently declaring that you belong to him. No other lie shall reign. No other truth about you has any other foothold in your spirit and your soul. You are God's child. Stand on that. That's where I want to wrap up tonight. Sunday, celebrating Bishop Thomas, 49 years. First Lady Thomas, 49 years. We are excited, y'all. Make sure you're in the house. You bring your gifts. Matter of fact, we're going to give offerings tonight for Bible study. Maybe you want to give your anniversary gift already. You can do that as well in the giving app. You should see a line that says past anniversary. You can give it there as well or bring it Sunday. We're going to be doing a special time of giving and loving on our pastor and first lady. So make sure you bring your gifts. I'm excited, y'all. I really am. I'm excited about continuing this series next week. Sunday, Pastor Watley will be with us. But this week after that, we're continuing this Standing on Business series. I hope you're going to be blessed by this. But we're getting ready to pray over our gifts tonight. And, and thank God for the opportunity to give back to him as we close out on this evening. But let me say it one more time. Don't forget, Sunday morning, 9 o'clock, we celebrate our pastor and first lady for the 49 years of dynamic ministry leadership to the New Psalmist Baptist Church. I'm encouraging you to tell somebody else to, to tune in online, to join us in worship. Maybe you have friends or family who have been blessed by the ministry of our, 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 our leading family, Bishop Thomas, Lady Thomas. Tell them, come on, we want to show them our love in this 49th year, which is kicking off this season of celebration, the 49th anniversary, the installation of a new pastor, and then that kicks off our full year as we lean into 50 and the full retirement of our pastor and first lady and ministry leadership. Y'all, God is doing something at New Psalms. It's a special time to be a part of this ministry. And God has gifted us to be a part of this season of transition and this season of celebration. So make sure you join us. We're believing God is going to do something great uh, starting on this Sunday, celebrating 49 years. If you got your gift and you haven't given it yet, get that gift prepared. Give LaFi, uh, Push Pay, Fellowship One, even texting in your offerings as well. You can use all the ways we give to give tonight to be a blessing to what we do here at New Psalmist to allow us to continue to present the gospel in these ways um, and to take it even to higher levels and higher heights. So thank you for your gifts. Thank you for what you've done to make ministry happen here at New Psalmist Baptist Church. But let's go to God in prayer as we close out tonight. Father and our God, we again say thank you for who you are and all that you've done. We thank you for the privilege to give back to you. And our God, I pray you bless these offerings, bless these gifts that are giving, bless the gift and the giver. And God, I pray that as we go forth, that we might seek the truth in all things, believing and knowing that you are God age of truth and a truth that shall hold on till the very end, a truth that shall outlast any lie, any deceit, any opposition. God, we thank you now for empowering us with the Holy Ghost that gives us the confidence to stand on business and declare greater is he that is in us than is he that's in the world. Now, God, continue to lead, God, keep and protect until we gather together again in the name of Jesus the Christ. And God, I pray a special prayer that on this Sunday, you show up and show out as we celebrate Bishop and Lady Thomas and the 49 years they've served at New Psalmist Baptist Church. Bless them in a special way. Let the outpouring of love even exceed anything 
any of us could have imagined or thought. In Jesus' name, together we all say, amen. God bless you, everybody. I'll see you Sunday morning as we celebrate our pastor and our first lady. Be blessed.